received a couple of flyers. The first one is, this is a, um, a special time of the year when we uh, commemorate the Holocaust. Um, you have a flyer. The local commemoration is on uh, Sunday the 23rd at uh, the Friedman Center. And it is sponsored by, um, let's see. Jewish Community Agency. The Jewish Community Agency. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, the second invitation is to uh, a new documentary on the Nazi betrayal of the rule of law. It's about the Nuremberg trials. And it'll be presented by uh, Dean Lawrence Rafel of the Turo Law Center. Um, and that is at Congregation Beth Ami in Santa Rosa. We hope that uh, some of you might be around um, towards the end of spring break to be able to attend those things. Um, I'm going to let uh, Human Rights Club, after our lecture, give you some information on some of the events that are left. But I do want to mention one, and that is um, on April 30th, we have uh, one of the organizers, organizers of the West Coast Day of Conscience. Tim, do you want to stand up and just say a thing or two about what's going to happen on the 30th of April? Well, if you go to archives.org, that's archives.org, there's all the information about books on, on April 30th. We're going to stand hand in hand across the Golden Gate Bridge and um, have a vigil for Darker, and then there'll be a rabbit at the field. It's just a little walk on the path um, afterward. And there'll be Jerry Fowler will speak. And I would also like to point out that um, there'll be a showing of Darfur Diaries on the 28th, um, or the 26th, I'm sorry. Uh, did everybody get one of these? Okay, I think this is sponsored by SP. Those are uh, your dollars being <coughs> sponsored. Um, and it's also in conjunction with the Human Rights Club. They're going to talk some more about what they um, have done arranged for him to come during spring break, his children's spring break, so that the family could come. And um, yeah, so if any of you, if you, any of you have any interesting indoor activities that might appeal to younger children, you might come up to Jerry after he speaks. Um, but enough levity aside, um, Jerry is a human rights lawyer. Um, he has done an incredible job in raising awareness about to April 30th when there is going to be a rally on the National Mall in Washington and as Myrna said and as Tim and Martina are deeply enmeshed in organizing there's going to be a companion rally here uh, in Northern California uh, a vigil on the Golden Gate Bridge and then a rally at Chrissy Field and that is the time for all of us across the nation to make our voices heard and um, uh, you will look back on this five years from now, 10 years from now, uh, and you will be able to say that you took a stand when genocide was happening. And this is a tremendous opportunity. And we've gotten to this point because of the work of so many people, but we can't let up now. That is my bottom line message. We can't let up now. And uh, April 30th, is going to be a very, very special day across the country. What I wanted to do, though, is to give you some more background, some more sense of what is happening in Darfur. Why is it that so many Human Rights Club has, has uh, put so much energy into this? And I'm going to show you some uh, photographs that I took. Uh, I've been to the region twice. Uh, I'll show you a map in just a minute. I haven't been into Darfur itself, but I've been to the uh, neighboring country of Chad and gone to the Sudanese border and met refugees and heard their stories and I want to share some of those stories uh, with you today um, and then I'm also going to have some pictures that were taken by a friend of mine uh, a man named Brian Steibel, Steidel who is a young American who was in Darfur for six months with this small African Union monitoring force that uh, is about the only protection that civilians in Darfur have and he brought back uh, pictures of what he saw and he he was witnessing 
this genocide and he just couldn't take it anymore because his mission was just to witness and to take pictures and to file reports that ended up someplace in Ethiopia. And so he left that and he came back and he's been traveling all around the country speaking about Darfur. And I have some of his pictures uh, that I'll show you. If I could just have the lights, I mean, I'm going to end up being a disembodied voice here. I always am. It is that it's a question. Who will survive today is a question. And we don't know the answer to it. When we uh, at the Holocaust Museum teach about the Holocaust or when we train teachers to teach about the Holocaust, one of the things that we emphasize is that just because something happened doesn't mean that it was inevitable. Just because the Holocaust happened does not mean that it was inevitable. It was the product of choices. Choices made by many people, including choices made by bystanders. And the same thing is true in Darfur from here on out. What is going to happen in Darfur is not inevitable, even though there are some very negative trends. What is going to happen is going to be the product of choices, choices that are made on the ground in Darfur, for sure, and choices that are made in the Sudanese capital of, of Khartoum, but also choices that are being made uh, in Washington, D.C. And we, as citizens, in turn, can influence those choices by the choices that we make, whether to stand up or to remain silent. Our choices will play a part in answering this question of who will survive today. One thing I just want to say about this photograph, uh, I took this photograph and I just remember so vividly talking to these people. It was a couple of older gentlemen and women and children. And they told me uh, stories similar to ones I'm going to relate to you about their villages being destroyed, being attacked, people being shot, people being killed, the villages being burned. And after they had told me their story, this older gentleman with my camera, and he folded his hands and he ducked his head, and he said, well, now this grandfather can be happy because I know somebody's taking our story back to America. And all the refugees that I talked to were so eager to tell their stories. And they really believed that if people knew what was happening to them, that there would be help. There would be help coming to them. And uh, it reminded me of something that I've heard from many, many Holocaust survivors that I've had the privilege of meeting. How many of them during the Holocaust felt abandoned, felt abandoned and they carry that feeling of abandonment with them 60 years still later, 60 years later. And these people that I met in, in Chad, these refugees, these people who had lost almost everything, were desperate not to feel abandoned. Let me just orient you for a second about the place that we're talking about. And I just have to say that the situation in Darfur is, is very, very complex. And it's always a challenge to respect that complexity, but not lose sight of the moral contours of the hundred. We don't know exactly how many. Maybe it's 200,000, maybe it's 300,000, maybe it's more than 400,000, and there are some reasonable estimates that suggest it's that high. But we know that it's hundreds of thousands of people, some of whom have been the victims of direct violence. They've been murdered. Um, others have perished because of the conditions of life that have been inflicted upon them. They've been driven into a desert, and I'm going to show you what, that, what it looks like, uh, where they can't survive without outside assistance. And for a long time, the government of Sudan was, was effectively blocking sure uh, some of those obstacles have been relieved. But even today, the security situation is getting worse. And as a consequence, the ability of international aid to reach people who need it is getting severely threatened. Thousands of women have been raped. Thousands of women have been raped. And they've been raped not just because they're women, but because they're members of a certain group. It is part of an assault on the groups that these women are members of. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of villages have been destroyed, burnt to the ground, and I'll show you images of that. Those civilian population that has been uh, the target of an unrelenting assault by the government of Sudan. Why is all this happening? Well, I don't have time to give you the full in-depth history of Sudan, but let me just try to give you a few, a few of the uh, key points. Um, basically, if you look at the map of Sudan here, and to give you a sense of, Sud Sudan is the largest country in Africa. It's often said that it is the size of the United States east of the Mississippi. Um, so it's quite, itself is quite large. It's uh, the size, well, people often say it's the size of France or Texas, but another way to think of it is it's the size of California. So it, it's, it's a big territory. 
And one thing about uh, Sudan, the country which became independent in 1956, is that historically, since independence and even before then, the power and the wealth in this area have been controlled uh, from the capital of Khartoum. Um, one expert once described Sudan as being similar to a big sink, and Khartoum is the drain. And so all the way down that drain. And the, the areas on the periphery have been marginalized. They've been economically marginalized. They've been marginalized politically. Uh, many of you may have heard for, for literally decades, there was conflict in southern Sudan because the, the people who live in the south were rebelling against this marginalization. And I should, I should, I should add that this, this uh, um, situation of marginalization is tied to, to identity. It's tied to identity and it's important is that the, the people in Khartoum who have traditionally held power in Sudan um, identify themselves as Arabs. They're sometimes called Sudanese Arabs. Um, and uh, they have um, had a, uh, a vision that, that everyone in Sudan should, should adopt um, Arab culture, Arabic language, and the Islamic religion. And many of the people around the periphery have different identities, particularly in the south, the southern part of the country, where uh, they're generally non they're overwhelmingly non-Arab. And so those issues of identity uh, combined with the issues of marginalization to create a lot of the, the, uh, the potential for mass violence. And so in the course of the southern conflict, uh, several million people died. They were either killed directly or again fell victims to conditions of life that were inflicted upon them. Well, in early 2000, and, or in 2001, 2002, a huge diplomatic effort, which was partly led by the United States, started to make all of this conflict in the South. And uh, as progress was being made um, on the basis of power sharing and wealth sharing, the uh, population in Darfur, especially the non-Arab population in Darfur, saw that the national pie was getting re-sliced and the Southerners were going to get a piece, but they weren't going to get a piece. And so they, uh, a rebellion began in early 2003. And the rebel groups drew their recruits largely, as I said, from um, in Darfur. And the government's response was, well, if these rebels come from the non-Arab ethnic groups, then uh, if we get rid of those ethnic groups, we'll get rid of the rebels. And so that's when they launched this assault that I've described on a civilian population of the, of the non-Arab ethnic groups. Uh, sometimes you see in the press a reference to Arab versus African. And that's a real oversimplification. Um, but unfortunately, the concept of distinct Arab and African identities have become more and more uh, salient. In Dar All of the Arab groups in Darfur are involved in this conflict. But the ones who are involved are the ones who have uh, the most tenuous connection to land and who are the poorest and who uh, see the potential for economic gain by uh, joining with the uh, government in driving these uh, other ethnic groups off the land. This is what the desert looks like. This is in Chad, but the desert extends into, um, um, into uh, Sudan. And so when I talk about that uh, they made out of plastic sheeting, the uh, aid agencies would give them plastic sheeting and then they would use sticks and cloth to create a little hut. And you can imagine what it would be like to have a family of five living in one of those huts uh, when it's 115 degrees outside. Uh, you can also see, and I'll show you a picture of this later, but that blurriness in the background is sand. And uh, a very common occurrence is a daily sandstorm where the wind starts blowing and uh, uh, there's just sand as you get uh, in Darfur and it's part of, of the, the uh, discourse that surrounds this uh, attack on the civilian populations. <clears throat> this just shows this area where this woman was sit sitting was just one of the bleakest places that I ever hoped to see. Uh, it was all of these trees just spread out and under each tree, people had plopped down to try to get a little shade. This was pretty far north, so it was very, very, very hot. And one thing in carcass is Brian Steidel, who witnessed some of these attacks. And what was remarkable is these attacks would happen even if the African Union mo monitors are standing there. Um, but he says it takes a lot of commitment to burn a village. I mean, you don't just 
light one of these comp one one hut and the rest go up. You have to do each one, but that's what they did all throughout Darfur. Sorry, the uh, children who are four and seven and two girls. And so this particularly touched me to see so many kids. Some of the kids are living in the moment the way the kids do whenever they get the opportunity. Um, this girl saw me taking a picture of the donkey, and so she wanted to be in it. So she came and started <laughs> playing games with the donkey. But there are also uh, a lot of the kids who are bearing tremendous burdens, and they're at risk. Uh, this baby, you start looking around, and, and for the girls or for the kids who are still in Darfur, uh, they are at tremendous risk. This is one of the pictures taken by Brian Steidel. One of his first pictures, actually, this girl was being carried on her mother's back. They wrapped their infants with, their, their, with cloth on their backs, and they were fleeing, and she was shot through the back. Her mother was killed, and the girl was in very bad shape. Uh, the Red Cross went back the next day, and they couldn't find the girl, so Brian doesn't know what happened to, to her. There we go. The basis of effective action is knowledge. And uh, one place that you can go to find constant news updates is our website, which is uh, www.committeeonconscience, all one word, .org. I'll show you that again in just a minute. Uh, and one thing that we have on there is actually an award-winning uh, uh, internet-based talk show called Voices on Genocide Prevention. It's a weekly show, weekly interview program that I host. And, uh, um, um, of raising awareness about Darfur, in clamoring for, for action, and in calling for uh, attention to be paid to this. And that is making a tremendous difference. And I've said it now several times, but I will finish by saying we cannot let up now. We cannot let up now. Uh, the efforts are starting to bear some fruit, and we have to just redouble those efforts. And um, so I just want to finish with an invitation to you to, uh, to join us in Redux. And uh, the, uh, um, what remains to be seen over the course of the now, I mean, what's in play now is will they finally take full steps, including the full step of authorizing a, uh, a UN force to, to augment and, and give power to the African Union force that's already there. And the politics of it are very difficult. China, in particular, has been very obstructionist. Um, so it is, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people of these people sorting through the loot. And you can see it's not just the, the militia men, it's, it's the broader community that's, that's involved in that. Um, my understanding is there's been a fair amount of intermarriage and, and that in general this, these concepts of identity are very fluid and they change over time and, uh, uh, and the, the rebels that the government was seeking to, to fight or not fight but were the reasons that they were attacking these civilian populations agreed to a ceasefire. Uh, and as part of the ceasefire, they agreed that they would invite the African Union to send in monitors to monitor the ceasefire. And so originally there were a few hundred, there were, there were a few dozen monitors, and then the monitors came with a protection force, not to protect civilians, but to protect the fire, not to protect civilians. But what they have done in certain places is uh, uh, provide some protection. For example, accompany women out to collect firewood from these, these big camps, these big conglomerations. Because when the women would go out, if men went out, they would be killed. If women went out, they were sexually assaulted. And, uh, um, but they had to have firewood. I mean, it was a terrible dilemma for them. So in some places, the African Union will go out with them and in that sense provide protection. Uh, the force has grown so that it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 7,000. Um, but it still really doesn't have a civilian protection mandate, and it's not that capable. I mean, it, it is not as well armed as everybody else, <laughs> I mean, including the government and the Janjaweed militia, and then the rebels. The rebels are not angels, and they've 
been responsible for attacking humanitarian aid workers. I mean, the scale of bad things they've done is dwarfed by the scale of bad things done by the government and militias. But the, the bottom line is that the African Union is the weakest force on the ground there. And uh, there have been some very embarrassing episodes where uh, a bunch of, or a number of AU soldiers were taken hostage. And so they sent a force to try to free the hostages and they got taken hostage as well. And uh, it's, they don't have very good communications equipment. Uh, they don't have intelligence. They don't have, for the most part, good trans has finally led to a recognition that there's gotta be a, a broader force and a multinational force, that there's just not the capacity there to protect civilians um, even when they want to. And, I'm just wondering about easing out of existence over on the Chad side. Is that much different than over in the, the Dorfor side? Is it, I mean, it looks pretty bleak over there. Is it that bleak on the Dorfor side for the most part? I mean, it doesn't look like there's much to support. And, I mean, that breaking work. But some, also, they had donkeys, so the donkeys they would use to plow. And so they would plant sorghum or millet and, and grow enough to, to keep them going. And then there's a lot of their wild berries. There's all kinds of different uh, things. Um, uh, and the population's fairly spread out, so you know it won't support big, huge cities and towns. But so people can live there, and they live. Yeah, I mean, part of their wealth is in their livestock. And you would ask people, I would ask refugees, not enough water. There's not enough wood. If you think about those uh, makeshift huts that were made with wood, well. You saw what the train looks like. There's not a lot of wood. And then also all those people are going out to collect wood for their fires every, every night. I mean, they cook over fires. So it's putting a tremendous amount of stress. And the consequence is that, um, the, uh, for example, malnutrition among the host population in Chad has gone up. So the Chadian population has suffered a lot by virtue of having happened. And in fact, there's one thing that we found in July when I was there is that there's increasing tensions. At first, the Chadian population was fairly welcoming and their ethnic ties across the border. And, but, but now there's a lot of tension and you know, it's just scarce resources becoming scarcer. Um, and we've got a limited ability to influence that, but that's part of the challenge. But ultimately, you know, I think many of you will have heard of this treaty called the Genocide Convention, which was adopted in 1948. The whole, the whole concept of genocide was a product of basically what we today call the Holocaust. And in 1948, um, this multilateral treaty was adopted that's called the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. And, uh, Many people have thought that that somehow governments to stop genocide when it's happening. And so a lot of people who put effort into getting in the United States to say what was happening in Darfur was genocide, thought that then there would be an obligation to do something. And I won't go into the whole thing because we're getting near the end of our time, but the convention doesn't really say that. But the bottom line is that governments are never going to stop genocide out of a sense of legal obligation. They're only going to stop genocide out of a sense of political or practical necessity for citizens. If citizens demand that their leaders act to stop genocide, then that's when we'll start stopping genocide. And until we demand that they do that, we're going to have replays of the situations that we've seen in Darfur, where it's taken a long time to get to the point where we are now. Rwanda, where nothing was done. Bosnia, where you know years went by and we had the worst massacre on the European continent since the end of World War II before there was a, such a political outcry in the United States that the United States had to get off the dump. All right, with that, I'll hand it over to the Human Rights Club. All right. Why don't you introduce yourselves? Okay. okay, my name is Janelle. I'm the treasurer of the Human Rights Club. I'm Lauren. I'm the president. And are you going to say anything? Okay? Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, our club got started as a result of Jerry Fowler's lecture last semester. So hopefully um, the Holocaust Memorial Museum is going to send our, um, our money to that organization. And Janelle yeah. will tell you more. This, this bowl comes to us from a Rwandan survivor as a gift. And we use it to pass around so that we can 
to uh, Thank you. share a gift back. So whatever you can. Um, and just to let you know a little bit about our club, last semester we did a Darfur campaign. It was one week, and we were able to raise about $500 that we sent to SaveDarfur.org this semester. Anyhow, so that's what we're doing. So if you want to order shirts, we're going to take orders. We have a limited supply of them left today, so if you want to come and get them now, that would be great. We're also going to, also going to be collecting money for pre-ordering, and we'll get more shirts in the first week of May, and we'll come back to the class and deliver them. So, go ahead. Yeah. To on the not today. I, do we have buses? Not, not that I know of. But These are such can, do, such can do people. I'm sure that they're going to look into. We'll probably there's no specific buses set up yet. So. That's until this Friday. Yeah. And then right. if you guys had any questions for our club, you can email us at SSU Human Rights Club at yahoo.com. Our next meeting is May 2nd. Right? Charlie Brown's Cafe at 7 p.m. So if you're interested in coming in, we do other stuff too with our club, but this is our main focus right now for these two weeks. Would the people in my section please come over here to this side of the stage?